So now we're going to talk about taste and the genetics of taste. Uh, why do we taste certain things the way we do? Obviously, chemical senses are important to us, uh, and they're usually there to help us find food, etc., and nutritious uh, information. Uh, we also use odorant molecules, which are very similar to, to this, right? Um, the basic tastes, of course, are sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and one that we call savory or umami. Right? That was something that was later added on to the repertoire. Um, with respect to sweet things, we tend to like them, especially when we're kids, because they're energy rich. They represent carbohydrates. These are the things that you need to get energy from. So obviously you would seek them out. Um, you have salty. This gives you information about electrolytes and solutions, such as sodium or potassium or magnesium. These minerals are important for your normal functioning of your cells. Sour gives you an idea of uh, the pH, protons in solution. Uh, sometimes it's a noxious indicator, right? And bitter was traditionally there uh, to tell you about alkaline uh, molecules. Usually, this is associated in nature with poisonous or toxic compounds. So we tend to have an aversion towards bitter things. Over time, you kind of learn to like certain bitter things, uh, but that is a learned thing. And umami, as we said, was savory, right? It comes from a Japanese word. Uh, and this is the amino acid sensation, or what we call the meaty taste. So usually um, when we talk about flavor enhancers, we'll talk about MSG or monosodium glutamate. That is the savoriness of something. And we can see that these are uh, physical receptors that are located on your tongue. Uh, they're proteins, and they receive information from the environment in such a way that tells your brain whether or not you want to eat something or whether you want to enjoy it. Remember that there are other uh, aspects of eating that affect what you like, such as texture and temperature and all that stuff. Um, so today we're going to talk about a completely artificial chemical called phenylthiocarbamide, or PTC. And phenylthiocarbamide is, as we said, a very artificial chemical that doesn't really exist in nature. So it's very important for us to understand that there is no selective advantage to having the ability to taste this. Right? Maybe at some point there was, we don't know. Uh, maybe there is something in nature that we don't know about. Um, but there are very similar chemicals, such as uh, this, that are found in things like broccoli or Brussels sprouts. And they bind, uh, this specific chemical binds to a bitter taste receptor called TAS2R38. Right? So it's this taste receptor, uh, subtype 238. And it's a protein that is expressed from uh, a DNA that is found in your genome. As I said, uh, the inability to taste certain compounds is usually due to a simple recessive Mendelian inheritance, right? Remember simple Mendelian inheritance, there's dominance and there's recessives. And if you have a recessive, uh, or homologous recessive, then you have an inability to detect this compound. Um, there are many, many different taste and odorant receptors uh, in, that have been cloned in the past 20 years. They're a very dominant uh, protein family. And the TAS2R28 uh, is um, this bitter, bitter taste receptor that enables humans to taste this compound called PTC. Incidentally, this is also found in the other great apes. And we can actually use that for some sort of lineage analysis as well. Uh, this gene consists of only one exon, so it's very convenient to study. Uh, or, you know, if we want to clone it and use recombinant DNA technology to study it. Um, no, ex no introns means that we don't have to get it from the RNA. We can get it straight from DNA. And it corresponds to a protein of 333 amino acids. There are three types of uh, SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, that correspond to... Uh, a sensitivity to the ability to taste PTC. And each known uh, SNP in this gene results in a change of the amino acid uh, sequence. We can see in this table below that um, there are these three different SNPs that exist. And they correspond to these specific amino acid uh, differences. 
remember that a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, DNA sequences where single nucleotides in the genome differ uh, are these SNPs, right? And when you have a SNP in the TAS2R38 uh, receptor, uh, it affects how well you're capable of tasting this. The G allele at, in one locus uh, results in a functional receptor, which grants you the ability to taste PTC. Uh, the C allele is a broken receptor. The whole protein exists. However, that one amino acid change renders it unable to bind to the, the taste uh, molecule. We remember that the codon chart looks like this on the right, and oftentimes you can have different types of SNPs that affect the coding. Uh, a SNP that falls in the coding region of a gene is called a coding SNP, which means that uh, any change to it might alter the amino acid sequence. But because there's a redundancy to the genetic code, often in the third position, that, that last that last position of each codon, um, not all SNPs will actually cause a change in amino acid sequence. As we said, not every coding SNP results in a, a functional change in amino acid sequence. There are silent SNPs, and in silent SNPs, oftentimes the, the redundant um, position, the third position as we see here, is the one that's mutated. And in that case, oftentimes you will have the same or identical uh, amino acid being coded for. There are things called missense SNPs. And missense SNPs will happen in a different position where it will cause a change in the amino acid um, sequence. Uh, this is the type of SNP that we're talking about when we talk about what we have in PTC and our ability to taste PTC. Here we see a tyrosine converted to a serine. And there's also something called a nonsense SNP. A nonsense SNP is a mutation which causes a premature stop. So instead of causing a, a different amino acid or not changing the amino acid at all, uh, there's a termination, there's a stop codon uh, that occurs. And therefore, you have a premature stop in the amino acid sequence. Um, SNPs are usually inherited together in certain combinations uh, within this type of gene, right? Uh, and we call them haplotypes when they're grouped together and, and usually inherited together. Um, so these are the frequencies of uh, the PTC uh, SNPs that occur. And certain haplotypes are generally correlated with taster status. So there are the ones that are outside of the region that we're going to look at uh, that influence how well someone can taste this. I know this is a lot of gibberish because all you see are three amino acid letters, AVI, AAV, PAV, but it's not important for us to uh, dwell on that. Just It's just so that we can understand that there are multiple linked uh, mutations or SNPs within this gene. PDC taste sensitivity displays a broad and continuous distribution. That means that it's like a quantitative trait, right? It behaves that way. That means there are probably some other genes that influence uh, our ability to taste this gene, not just this, uh, this chemical, I mean, not just this gene itself. And on average, PDC taste sensitivity is highest with those with the haplotypes of PAV, PAV. Uh, they're, they're homozygotes. Um, and we have non-tasters that have this AVI, AVI non-taster uh, genotype. Uh, there are other types that are rare, heterozygous, that have an intermediate ability to taste this, right? Uh, and all non-human primates examined to date are homozygous for the tasting haplotype. So that means somewhere in the primate line, uh, this became somewhat important. And you have to remember that we eat totally differently than our other primate uh, relatives. So this might be a case where we were able to lose this uh, and not have any loss of function uh, in our survivability. There are also non-taster chimps though, and it happens to be a different mutation than humans. So that's kind of a weird thing. In the lab that we're doing, we're going to look at our ability to taste PTC. We're gonna have 
pieces of paper that have no chemicals on them that we use for control. And we're going to rate our l dislike or like of this material. There's also going to be some pieces of paper that have different chemicals on them. And we're going to taste them. And we're going to qualitatively indicate what they taste like, if we like them or not. Uh, some of you will notice that your peers don't react at all. And some of your other peers will react very strongly. Uh, and that has to do with their ability to taste this. Those that, who react very, very strongly are what we call super tasters. And we're going to identify why that's the case uh, in this lab. So as you know, we've actually isolated our DNA and we've amplified our DNA at this locus. And the way that this works is we have two primers as is always the case with PCR. One primer is we call the left primer and one primer is called the right primer. And in one of these primers, we have a, an intentional insertion of a um, SNP. The intentional insertion of this SNP makes it so that if you have a if you have a um, a tasting uh, allele, it adds another um, SNP to it that provides or creates a restriction site called for the restriction enzyme HE3. And in this case, when you amplify this DNA and you digest it with HE3, you will see in a taster two bands, a short uh, product and a intermediate product. Whereas those who do not taste it at all have a, uh, a large product of 221 base pairs, which is the size of the whole amplified piece of DNA. So it's up to you to decide or understand why some people will have, be super tasters and why some people will be ju just be tasters. And we're going to identify that and then analyze the results of our gels uh, and figure this out. And this is going back to the question, is this why I hate broccoli? As I said, it's referred to as the broccoli taste, but it's not something that is found in broccoli. And not all people hate broccoli. You remember that. It's just a matter of uh, what we're used to and how we were brought up as well. But the ability, the absolute ability to taste it and not taste it are the things that we're studying. And that's something that you can't learn if you don't have the capacity to, uh, to receive the information from the molecule.